And everybody, welcome to another edition of Your Money Radio Daily Story. Hunter Mazingo, Alex Kutu, just on Vanderboard with you. Uh, listen, stock numbers and market lovers, really interesting uh, market. Um, you know, uh, scare you out, wear you out comes to mind. I want to show you something with the VIX. But Danny, I'm, I'm going to disappoint you. I was going to tell you that I'm broadcasting live from my mother's basement, which was true, which is where I shot uh, thir Wednesday's video uh, for, for stock nerds. But uh, I took my dad into work uh, this morning, and I'm in his office now uh, sitting. So it, take, it took me a while to get on the internet uh, to figure out how to do that here. And I, of course, uh, nobody has passwords. It's like you, Danny. I'm, I'm used to it, though. Nobody has passwords for anything here. And so I I figured out how to get on. I think I'm on, like, the Comcast City Internet. But it seems to be working. Wow. Yeah, I'm I think they you don't have any sensitive data on your computer. No sensitive data, uh, but here's the thing. If I get kicked off, I don't know. I think I think we're not going to get kicked off. I think they have it turned on for all the homeschooling that's going on uh, with the pandemic. Uh, that seems to be winding down, hopefully, and so uh, we'll get going there. Um, you know, I, well, I, I wonder. I was kind of upset you weren't in your basement because I was going to say party on, Tim. Like, no, well, my basement, I've got all the sports cards, my whole uh, childhood collections down there, and it's dusty. Oh, my God, we're not down there then. Yeah, I found uh, Brutus the Barber beefcake uh, cards. I found uh, Hulk Hogan cards. I found Macho Man cards. I got, um, I found uh, Mean Gene Okerlund cards, and Mean Gene's the man. Uh, I was going to talk about the VIX. Like, the VIX here. Um, is uh let me just draw right here so i put the vix on standard bollinger bands and uh i found that when you kind of dance around uh two days maybe three days at this upper range of the bollinger band you tend to want to come off and that tends to uh, be followed you know like in, in just in tandem with higher prices in the s p so the candles here uh are the s p uh, 500 and the bars here my friends are the VIX price levels. And so you can see you get about three or four days of price action up here at the upper bow in Japan. And that's really kind of the, like, uh, a lot of comments, well, I don't know about a lot of comments, but uh, discussion around uh, the VIX didn't invert with this sell-off, and, and it's the S&P's been holding up. It's the NASDAQ that's been the issue. And I, I don't use the cash fix, or it, no one calls it the cash fix, but me, so you can make fun of me for it. But I make fun of people who make fun of me for calling it the cash fix because nobody knows how to use this VIX. <laughs> because when you're looking here, uh, Danny, is 21 too high or too low for the state of the market right now on the VIX? It depends on whether the VIX is, if the market's going to sell off, that means it's too low. If the market's going to rally, it's too low. <laughs> exactly. Like it's. It's the most garbage analysis that you'll find on television or the internet. 26 is too high. 26 is too low. 21 is too low. The VIX should be at 50. And what people are doing 90% of the time is that they're taking their market, I was about to say their market affiliation, but they're looking at the markets through their prism. And so if you're bear, Danny, Danny, who were you telling me before we started the show? Ha Harry... Harry Dent. Oh, Harry, Harry Dent, the one. The, the one <laughs> he's, he's been, he's been he's right. He's an economist, but he can't make. But he owned up with up three ETFs. He had to shut them in two or three years. They roll them out every time. But he's he's predicting doom and gloom. Nineteen twenty nine. Right. They got the one major bull market in the late nineties, right? And ever since then, he's been a. You know, they they love him, but he's been wrong every Ooh. other time. Who loves them? Who loves Peter oh, Schiff, by the way? I mean, I'm talking about the financial media, the big brokers. Financial are. media loves them? I oh think. My God. I think listen, that... listen, in the late 90s, they actually, I got an invitation. It was a buddy of my dad's, actually, that worked for, um, oh, they've shut it. Uh, not Morgan Stanley, not Mary. Um, Lehman Brothers? No, it's it's the one that's no longer in existence, but it's real uh, kind of hoodly flutely. It's. it's <laughs> Oh, oh, well, then by that, by that description, I'm going to go with E.F. Hutton. Oh, hoodily flutily, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's one of those. That clears, clears it right up. It was, it was one of those high end firms. That, I'll think of it a minute. I'll think of it. Was E.F. E. Hutton high end? I don't feel anyway, like. Anyway, they they, they, no. they would they would they would. Uh, it's when I first kind of started. You know, it was early in my career, and the guy invited me to go speak because you know it was tickets and it was expensive. You know, it was hard to get in, and the guy told me. You know, said, listen, if you, you know, just if you go to this thing and you bring a couple clients, man, you, you'll do some business. Because then it was still about selling products. But 
Is that all you got to this story? Tell me there was something more to this. Than oh, just no, he waiting. just went about his demographics and all that kind of stuff. And how oh, market- let me, you lost me there. So let me just get the stock, the stock nerds who might have been lost back on track. So Harry Dent was speaking at an event. You went to it. And, yes. all, he did was, and all he did was scare people. Well, at that point, he was uber bullish. And this was like right at the end of 1999. Oh, I got you. So, so he called, he marked the top by being bullish. He, he called a ride for the next three months. God bless Harry, Dad. Um, God bless so, Prince Harry, too. Oh, yeah. Oh. That's how you're going to work that in there? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Harry Dent. Um, God, Don, you made me dumb with that joke. Now I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> Danny, and Danny made me dumb with that story. Now I'm trying to figure out where the hell I was going with this. Just think where hoodly you... doodly. Jesus, yeah. God, hoodly. I, I swear this in my IQ points. Every time, Danny, you tell a story like that, I just, like, I'm just hoping I know how to stand to pee when I'm done with the show today. <laughs> I'll give God you some bless. Did you know in I Sweden bless. it is uh, recommended that men sit down to pee for hygiene purposes? You know, if anyone did anyone just hear a phone ring? Did you guys just hear that? I think that's a fax machine in this office because I was looking. I'm not making this up. Yeah, but I think that's in your head. No, I was there. There was a machine that just rang, and I think because I'm looking here. I just want to know if Don sits down to pee. Yes. I don't. I hold on. I stand stand on the seat. I'm going to defend (laughs) people who sit there. I will absolutely. Hey, there are there are middle of the nights where Remy gets me up at like three because he needs something. And he asks very nicely. I am absolutely sitting down to pee. I'm going to stand on that throne and proudly and say that, well, I'm going to sit on that throne, that at 3.30 in the morning, I'm absolutely, there's a good chance that I don't have balance and I can't see because I don't know where my glasses are. And I, but I know how to sit. <laughs> and I am absolutely going to do that. And I am proud to claim that title. Absolutely. You, you heard it here on your money radio, folks. Tim says yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Listen, you hit 45 and try scared. to find where you're going. I'll tell you what, I have stubbed. Well, I, I have. You're, I, you're 58, brother. Yeah, I know. I don't have and any then, problems, though, so and, I can understand listen, that. These sitting lessons are very hard learned. You wake up, you're like, I thought I hit the bowl. No, you go, you know what? You know what's going to solve this problem? Sitting. Sitting's going to fix this problem. So anyway, about the VIX, I have no idea where we go. So, <laughs> so the VIX right here uh, is coming off. And so this is the thing. Oh, we we're talking about VIX prices. Is VIX too high? Is VIX too low? And, and this is the problem. Nobody knows. Like, this is a market product. And so when you walk into the Piggly Wiggly, and by the way, saw a Piggly Wiggly for reals in uh, Tennessee. Uh, on the drive up to Pennsylvania with the kids. So I worked you, at Piggly Wiggly. I know. That's why I brought it up. I thought he was going to take a go. picture that I forgot okay. because one of the kids wanted to get a coffee. Okay, I wanted to get a coffee. The kids wanted to get a coffee. <laughs> yeah, one of the kids wanted to get a coffee. Here's a double espresso. <laughs> I'll tell you what, that kid was pretty happy the whole trip. I can't I can't complain one bit. But uh, the VIX is is such a – it's a market product, and people forget that. And when you start assigning levels – uh, to the VIX in your mind based on your prism of how the market should be be acting here, that's when I think you get into trouble where you are uh, off sides on the market. Maybe you're, you're selling markets or you're shorting markets and you should be long markets or you're just missing uptrends altogether because you, you're, you're, you're like this thing, there's no way this thing can rally. And people missed out on last year. They missed out on any, any kind of up move uh, this year. It's because of this issue, and I think a lot of it has to do with uh, it's tied to the VIX. But nobody that I I can't, I'm quite sure there's credible sources that can talk about the VIX. But when you're talking about the VIX as a timing mechanism, I'd, I that's how I use it, and it doesn't mean it's the end all to be all. And that's not what I'm saying. But you're going to get about two to four days of action up at the upper Bollinger Band, and then. And then it's going to typically uh, come off, and so. Well, it's a con. Uh, it's, let me see. it's a concurrent indicator at, at best. I mean, it happens. Yeah. Exactly why the market happens. So unless you're 
just Johnny on the spin. It's still it's still guessing. That's why that big future. And and look look at what's happened here. Like and this is why people can get off sides very easily. And I I have other things I want to talk about here, but this this upper bowl, like you got two or three days up here, and now S and P's are at a new high. And so I often want to defer to, and let me see if I can pull the chart up because I, I don't know what I did with it. Uh, I, oh, here it is, put call. And so just take a look at what the action with the put call ratio. So the put call spikes up here a couple days ago uh, above the new level, which is just, you can see there's 0.7. It's in between 0.6 and 0.7 that where the red line is. That's the new um, put call ratio for me that I'm using. And you can see what's taking place here with the S and P's, and and you get that kind of reading up this level with a put with a, a ten day moving average that's trending higher. You 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 don't want to find yourself off sides in uh, in the markets, and at the at the very least, I think you just want to you want to be cognizant of where you are in time and space. And I'm sorry, I'm going to I'm trying to get all you fellows back here. Feel like asses and elbows today i'm out of my element daniel but anyway uh and i feel i feel that's what's happening right here with the markets in this uh wednesday thursday and potentially uh, we're taping the show on a thursday this week as we head into friday you've got this bullish this bullish move in markets right now and if you're trying to use the vix to time uh to time your entries or listen to people on the vix i think it's a really difficult uh proposition and i don't i don't think it's very effective yeah, the way the way it's talked about in media. So I don't think that was a good topic, fellas. I'm gonna I'm not gonna lie to you. Like if I'm grading the show right now, the way I started it, I don't think that was a good start. But I got something else, Danny. Hey, Tim, Tim, you did fine as long as you pitted, you peed sitting down. We're good. You, you know that was the highlight of the segment. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> and look, um, I was gonna. Joined, as I was he waiting. Joined the rest of us. Yeah, but he doesn't look like Hunter. I mean, his haircut no, makes no, him look normal. Short, short hair, you know, short. <laughs> um, I was, I was, I was, as uh, I was sitting here waiting for you fellas to join, I wrote our sell-offs opportunities because stocks only go up, right, Danny? Yeah. 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 And so yeah. when I'm looking, our sell-offs are our opportunities. Um, I want to show you something. And so when I'm looking at S&Ps, right, let's keep it on the ES. So here's a weekly chart of the S&P. Let's get it on daily chart. S&Ps go up and hit a new high uh, this week. If I can, if my charts, if my charts will uh, work with me here, everything just got, so there we go. And so I'm looking at the daily charts and I'm going to come out. So you hit, you don't hit quite a new high on the ES futures. ES futures are 39.59. You're at 39.52. So, uh, Pretty pretty good level right there. Uh, maybe this is it. Maybe the markets start to ebb back. I don't know. But when when you when I think about our markets, and this is not a thought out topic, Danny. So I'm going to probably need some supporting action here from the fellas and you. Our sell offs opportunities, and I say in stocks, I say no. And with the indices, I say yes. And so um, let me just put out my theory here that the way our retirement system is set up, which is very different than the rest of the world, the, the US retirement system for uh, working adults is based on the stock market. Nobody believes that social security is gonna save them. And so, or that it's social security is your way to uh, an abundant lifestyle after you've stopped working. If markets are allowed, to, uh, and I use the word allowed on purpose here. If markets are allowed to puke and, and just uh, like they did in 08, that's, that can take years to overcome. But, and, and, I, and I, so the indices are designed, like if I put this on a weekly chart, uh, let's get it up to a weekly chart and I'm gonna zoom out here. I mean, it's clear, Danny, that, you know, Buy, buy the bottom and just just ride it up, right? The last time they let the markets puke was 09, well, 07, 08, into 09. And you get this really big uptrend. But a lot of people, I think, don't stop and think about what the indices really are. They're actively traded funds. Through mergers, uh, stocks are taken out of the S&P. 
through underperformance, stocks are removed from the S&P and, and, and they're replaced with what, Danny? The, the, the names that are performing. And so this is an actively managed fund. And if, and, and if I take it to stocks now, like, uh, and I say, well, stocks maybe aren't the opportunity. And look, I, I do believe that stocks are the opportunity, but I'm not so sure about sell-offs present an opportunity in stocks because it depends on which stock. And this is where I want to head to. So like, think about CCIV. Now these are, I'm going to name some SPACs here. So just bear with me. I'm absolutely, I'm going to tell you that I'm cherry picking um, but I want to remind you that along the journey of Amazon becoming Amazon, it pulled back 97% multiple times. Amazon wasn't just this behemoth. Uh, in the dot-com implosion days, Amazon was a very sketchy idea that maybe didn't have a future. So where did people pile in, Danny? Into that stalwart Yahoo. And so, like, when you look at uh, a CCIV here, or how about... Um, what about a Nikola? Like, is Nikola ever going to come back to? I don't even think that's the high price. The high price of Nikola is uh, last June at 94. It's trading 17, and the market's littered with ideas like this. And I think that's why the buy. I don't. I don't buy into uh, the buy and hold per se for two for two distinct reasons. If you're going to say buy and hold stocks you assume that you're in the right stocks, that you're in the stocks that are gonna be in favor. And if you want even further proof of that, just look at a chart of Microsoft uh, from, from the dead decade, MSFT, and let's get it on a monthly chart here. We'll go uh, monthly. And let me see if I can get, uh, oh, it only let me, it'll, let me see if I can get it back on a weekly to 20 years, weekly 20 years. Here we go. Look at this flatness. So here's the peak right here. Here's the dot com implosion. Lower left hand side of your screen is where I'm drawing. And look. Look at how far I had to draw, Danny, till we started doing that. Like that's that's a really long time to be waiting for the stock that I mean it, it, it didn't go bankrupt, but what stocks were moving? What stocks did you miss? in between that time waiting for Microsoft to quote unquote come back. And so there's a huge opportunity cost with the buy and hold mentality. And there's a huge opportunity cost with your in individual stocks and you believe in them so much that they're going to come back. And I, maybe Nikola does come back. Maybe uh, Space does come back. Maybe CCIB does come back. But I, I, don't, I don't know if sell-offs are opportunities per se. Uh, in individual stocks, but it seemed seemed a little controversial to me to discuss, and I thought I'd throw it out to uh, Don and see what he thought. It it totally depends on the type of pullback. If you're getting a low volume pullback in a leading stock, it pulling back into an uptrending support level like a 21 or a 50 day moving average is absolutely a buying opportunity. If it's cutting through it uh like a hot knife through butter the way stocks like ai did after their uh after they peaked then no it's absolutely not an opportunity you're catching a falling knife at that point let's break that down for one second i want you to tell me what's uh i want you to show the i know what you're gonna say i think i know what you're gonna say i shouldn't assume uh tell me the difference between uh a stock that is an opportunity and a sell-off potential a potential opportunity and a sell-off and then give me the give me a stock that is uh, just hot garbage that you should probably step away from until it changes well, back up again. A AI, looking at that chart, is, is an example of, of both. Uh, around the middle of the chart, right before the bars turn yellow, that was uh, a decent pullback into an uptrending moving average, and it bounced off there the way it should. Problem is, when it approached new highs, it started selling off again. There's your new highs that start selling off again. That's another opportunity to buy it, but if it doesn't work, you got to get out. Uh, right. All we're all we're doing is weighing the probabilities, and the, the probability is that if the market is going to continue in an uptrend and stocks like this are going to stay into favor, it should bounce at that moving average and go higher. Uh, a consolidation should resolve in the direction of the trend. When it doesn't, then the story's changing, and no matter how much conviction you have about the stock, it's time to pull the ripcord. 
I want to jump in there real quick because I want to make sure I want to make sure the listeners that Don what Don just said is very important. I want to make sure they, they that it didn't you know didn't miss their ears. So when when the market is still in an uptrend, but that stock is breaking down, that's really bad. A good leading stock should be not only staying up with the market but outperforming. If it's if it's going against the trend, it's going in a downtrend while the market's going in an uptrend. That's absolutely a sell. But one other thing, I want to make sure that we're distinguishing between a market sell-off and a stock sell-off. So those are individual stocks and have to have specific rules, buys and sells if they break levels or if they pull into support, you buy. On the indexes, you're going to kind of use some similar rules. But the one thing that is true is to be able to buy the dip or buy the pullback, you've got to have cash. If you're fully invested and you write it down, you don't have anything to buy with. So as the market starts getting weak, you're going to have individual stocks breaking down. You'll be pruning those. The ones that hold, you'll hold. The ones that don't break down, you'll break down. And if the whole market's going, you may have some sector or broader ETFs that you may let go. So that in the next cycle, you've got cash to get back in. So you need buy rules and sell rules both. Absolutely. And for me, um, I, I prefer at the mean, like I prefer, I need the 21, which is that pink line on your charts. I, I need to see that line hold. And so um, like right here, I think that like you're looking at space and I, I just want to make sure, and Danny, you did it and I, want, I don't want to put words in Don's mouth, but that's an uptrending stock uh, that pulls back to the mean. And for me, that's, if you're going to take a shot in a stock, that's the lowest risk place to do so. And the reason why the lowest risk place for me to do so isn't say down here at the 200 day, I, that's just not how I trade. It doesn't mean whoever does that is wrong. I find I, I'm gonna find more opportunities at the 21. And then if it starts closing below the 21, I, I pretty much know I'm wrong. And so then it becomes management of, of the stock. And it doesn't matter what it is for me, if it's a commodity, it's a Bitcoin, if it's, uh, if it's an indice. And then, and then you got to make a decision. And I, I have a feeling, based on some of the emails I've been getting uh, and direct messages, um, that a lot of people rode a lot of these things down. And so then what you have now is, uh, I believe the NASDAQ's above the 21 as we speak. Is that right? Yes. Okay. The yeah. Cues so are, now, I'm looking at the cues now. Yep. Yeah, yeah, the futures are. And so here, here's the thing. Now, uh, let's pretend... You know what? Let's look at on an on an uh, ATR chart because uh, it gets it gets gets you off the 50-day and the other moving averages. So here's the uh, Nasdaq on uh, an ATR chart, and so you're clearing the ATR right here. And so this zone of coming down to minus two, and there's a really good chance that if uh, markets can close twice above this level, that you're going to go up and probably touch this one. Uh, positive one ATR zone, and and that's what we're, we're trading at 13,000 right now, and that's up here at 13. Uh, we'll just round up here, called 13.4. That's 400 points. That, that you're, that, that's a super duper bullish move. Uh, and and but you got to understand, look look at this range that you've been in. <laughs> so this is a daily chart of the Qs, the daily point range. The average over the last 21 trading sessions has been almost 400 points. You're at 300 points today, and you still haven't exceeded the average daily range for the last 21 days. So these markets have been incredibly volatile. And so I think it would help. Don, could you lament on some of the criteria? You, we just did it with the moving averages, but what are some of the fundamental things you're looking for for stocks that are opportunity. So they know the technical uh, phase of it, you know, the stock trending to blow, excuse me, above the 21, not trading below some moving averages. Can you give me some fundamental uh, criteria that you're looking at? Uh, sales growth, that is, I, I really like a minimum of 40% uh, for the most recent quarter and preferably uh, earnings growth the following two years and the, the stats that I'm using are what are provided on MarketSmith, which is the, the screening and charting platform that I use. Mm -hmm. 
So if somebody, if a, if a company grew earnings in the most cre previous quarter by say 40%, but their sales were flat or down, then they did it by cost cutting. And that may or may not be sustainable. So I'm, I'm going to put that near the bottom of my list because the earnings were there, but the sales weren't. Sales will ultimately lead to earnings in a well-run company. Uh, but but you can, IBM has done financial engineering for years to generate EPS growth while their sales were dwindling. All right, here's the, let's get, I'll just zoom out. That's a great point. I've got, I've got way old lines on here. Let me remove all these draw lines. So, um, which brings, I guess is a good question here. So what what kind of exception to the rules are you creating in terms of a SPAC play? Like, give me a SPAC that uh, Hunter, or Alex, or Don, give me a SPAC that's uh, that's on your radar that you're that you're looking at. Maybe there isn't one. I, I don't know. Well, one like uh, it it comes down to knowing the story, not necessarily. Uh, and if you've dug into the sales, I you know I bought a couple of them, but I tend to stay away from them. One that I did buy was Butterfly. That oh, great like, story, uh, BFLY, yep. uh, the Which day of the do conversion. Have sales. Yeah, they have a, sales. A lot of them don't. A lot of them don't. Them. And it's a great story. Hunter and um, Alex did a lot of nice research on it. But the story is great. But when it started breaking down, we're not going to let the price uh, interfere with our – or we're not going to let our conviction interfere with the price. We're going to wait for it to set up again. Maybe they report a quarter of blowout earnings, and then there's going to be plenty of opportunity to get in it. The key right. thing is to remember not to lose big, because you'll never forget your big losses, but you won't even remember your small ones. So that's the whole idea is preservation of capital. you got to be able to stay in the game. What's that, yeah. Hunter? What's the Magic and Mushroom it's Company? And it's a big CMPS. Compass. There it is, Compass Pathways. Because yeah. uh, that's a thing, Hunter. I've seen, I've done some reading on this therapy, and has educated me on it as well. Do they have it? They don't have any sales, do they? No, they're pretty much pre-revenue. I can double check on Market Smith, but yeah, as that, I've looked that, last, that, that's pretty much nothing. Yeah, no sales that I can see. And, anyway. and look at the difference. Yeah, and that that's that's the difference between you know conviction. You know, you I think what Don, what you're saying is. There's no sales to support this price. It's pre-revenue. But listen, Amazon, someone surely in our audience is screaming, yeah, Amazon got that pass all the time and Tesla before they made money. But they had, but you don't confuse profits with sales. And so Amazon clearly had sales. Tesla clearly had sales. Whether that, whether or not they wanted to ch choose to turn a profit was Amazon. Clearly, in the by hindsight, it was Amazon's uh, decision and Tesla. They 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 can control their spend or uh, just pull a different couple of different. Well, I, I mean, you you can get locked into your rigid commitment that you're not going to buy something that doesn't have earnings. But Amazon reinvested in the company for a decade. Yeah. They had a vision of how they wanted to do things. They wanted to get their infrastructure set up. They wanted to get uh, customers hooked on Prime. So that that's the first place you go to when you order something, and then once all that foundation was laid, uh, they took advantage of it. Well, the that's, key is the key is when they're pre-revenue. I mean, when they're pre-earnings and their their revenue is growing, is they're stealing market share. So Amazon was losing, but they were stealing market. I'll never forget Cofall, my old partner, kept saying, yeah, "It's not even making any money. It's not making." I said, "So what? It's driving other companies out of business." And it, within a couple of years, they raise their prices by a dime. And all of a sudden, they're profitable. It's not much. The margins are thin, but they've got such volume. He, he, Kofal, to, to give listeners a little sense of uh, Dan's old business partner, Dan, whose also name was Dan, Dan Kofal. I remember uh, we were talking about Amazon or Tesla one day, and, and I, I make no bones about it. Dan Kofal did not care for me as a human being. And so um, – what's that? <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I missed what you said. I want to oh, – all right. I, I missed the joke. Um, so uh, we were discussing Amazon and uh, I think Tesla at the time, but maybe it was just Amazon. And he wanted to base all of his stocks. He goes, they don't have any free cash flow. Free cash flow is the most important thing to a company. And, and I said, it might be the most important. It might be the lifeblood of a company, cash, cash on hand. Uh, but cash flow to the stock market 
you're going to pay up for growth. Like what he, matters? He was looking for free cash flow, and that's okay if you're underwriting for bankruptcy. If you're really worried about how safe <laughs> the company is, but you want growth, the growth stocks are more important. Which brings me to the point of, and, and Dan Kofal, for all of Dan Kofal's Dan Kofalisms, was really wicked smart when it came to uh, economics and uh, economic issues. Like he was, re he was really brilliant in this regard. And um, terrible at making money. Well, that's the thing. Like, that I can't name one. That doesn't mean one doesn't exist. Who are the brilliant economists that are also good stock pickers? That are also able to read markets? And they don't. To my knowledge, they don't exist. The economist who, who like uh, who comes on? Who's the guy that looks like the tip of an eraser uh, on a on a number two pencil? He teaches Austin at the, Goolsby. Thank you, God. I said, oh, "Wow, that's amazing." That I held up this device, and you said Austin Goolsby. God Almighty! <laughs> it, if I if I said, I consider him a great economist, but. Anyway. Oh, I think he considers himself a great economist. Oh, uh, he definitely he considers yeah. himself. <laughs> Like, can we just go back to the fact that I held up a number two pencil and someone <laughs> said Austin Goolsby? Like, that's the... <laughs> We're playing charades. Who is this Austin Goolsby? Jesus, that's... <laughs> Next week, live, we'll have Pictionary, folks. So, uh, I, I, that might be the best joke we've ever made on the show. Who looks like a number two pencil? Austin Goolsby. Oh my gosh, that's great! There, there, that's the headline right there. That's that's the lead-in for the. Oh, that that might be better than anything we joked about with all with uh, Hunter last week. God, that you was need to good. see a picture of this guy. Also, pull him up. Oh my gosh, he does. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, reaction is natural, right? Like you, does he not look like a number two pencil? His hair, yeah. <laughs> I see it. <laughs> oh. I didn't know who you guys were talking about, so I had to look it up. Yeah, and I, like they might be able to tell you uh, what the you know the different aspects of the economy, but very few of them. And it's uh, uh, they're not good stock pickers. They're, they're not market readers, and because things are are counterintuitive. And so, and I'm going to make a real simple point about the counter intuitiveness of the markets by just using the put call ratio you know if i told someone who doesn't who doesn't endeavor into this uh what we do you know everybody's buying puts everybody's buying puts uh and and so the and, and the markets at that point are really low they, they, they they've been selling off and you're measuring it by ratio the put call and uh, someone like, uh, like, I shouldn't put words in uh, Austin Goolsby's mouth, but someone like him might say, oh, yeah, the market's going to tank here because uh, X, Y, they're going to go find in their Rolodex of a mind the economic information to match what price is happening in the markets. And they're not the only ones that do that, stock nerds. You do that. Everybody does that. When you have a preference for what you want the markets to do, go up or down. Most people don't say, gosh, I just wish the markets would go sideways today. A lot, very few people do that, unless you're selling put credit spreads. I do that all the time then. But when you, you see Alex, Alex does that sometimes too. I don't, not too much, not too little, just straight sideways. And so when, when you're looking at the markets through your prism, you can often find that piece of economic data that supports your worldview. And when I tell you Danny gets these emails on the regular, he gets them from you stock nerds. That's why I get them. Everybody gets them because you're, you're, you're sending us your supporting piece of information that you found on the internet through Twitter, through some newsletter that you subscribe to that supports what potentially price is going to do that you want it to do. But when you look at this uh, put call ratio here, Oftentimes, the higher it goes, the closer you are to bottoming, not just falling off the cliff. And well, Tim, would you bet money with that? I, I outlined how I how I trade these types of markets in um, when I started. I knew I was forgetting something in Wednesday Wednesday night's video. And so um, I forgot to pull up Wednesday night. I forgot to pull up our website, Danny. Danny, you're going to have to do this. Uh, 
uh, going to uh, our information. Can you do it from memory? Can I do it from memory? Yeah, because uh, I totally forgot. I just realized as I was talking about Wednesday night video, I forgot to pull up our website and our Twitter pages. I just oh, jumped yeah. right into the show. Yeah, what, what, what do you want to know? I did, without looking, tell us our phone number. Uh, it's 855-REAL-WEALTH. Easy. 855-732-5932. I like real wealth better because people are listening. They can remember it. What's Hunter's What's Hunter's email address if they want to talk to him about uh, marriage advice, how to get engaged with a good haircut, how not to get engaged with a bad haircut? <laughs> Prince, Prince, Prince Valiant haircut. Uh, yeah. Uh, Hunter at revereasset.com. What if they want to get a hold of Don? Don at revereasset.com. There's a theme, right? It, Alex has got an email address. What's his? Alex at revereasset.com. When's your wedding anniversary? Uh, 523. What year? You just said you just gave a month, and I can't verify this. <laughs> I guess you don't have to remember the year. 2004. I guess you don't have to remember there, Hunter. You're right. I, 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 523? 523. Would you, do, would you be honest? I didn't you, on her birthday, so I only had to remember one day a year, man. I was smart. smart. That's why I mixed Valentine's Day in with the engagement. It just kind of brings the two together. Yeah, but the engagement's not gonna matter once you get married. Yeah. You don't celebrate that day anymore. You know, in the you interim, know. in the interim, it buys me a year. <laughs> you know, that brings <laughs> me to a- behind you, Hunter, did you know that? You just walked in. Danny, do you remember when I got engaged <laughs> in time? <laughs> he looked. <was. laughs> Danny, remember? Did I miss a I got... joke? Yeah, yeah, I said, I said, so Hunter was saying that about, oh, it bought me a year. You know, I got engaged, so it bought me a year. And I said, Hunter, she's right behind you. She yeah. walked in, he turns around and looks. <laughs> Danny, I don't know if you remember this. Remember when uh, I got engaged and Tanya stopped talking to me? What did you do? I can't remember. What did you do? Remember, I I, I, I had, who was the fellow that was Kofal's assistant that helped him out? We keep, uh, not Eric. Um, I'll think of it. You know who I mean, right? It was one of them, but it was before Zach. Yes, yes. Yeah, Kofal had an assistant who would book his, do all his bookings. And um, I was having him stitch together all the videos and pictures I had so I could um, take Tanya back to Pennsylvania uh, and put a movie on and, and ask her to marry me. Well, before that, though, um, we were scheduled to go on a vacation together, uh, but I canceled it. Uh, I told her at the last minute I couldn't go and I had to go home to Pennsylvania to help my parents uh, do something. And here, that's right. She, that's right. Yeah. It was a ruse to get her up there so you could get engaged. And she was so pissed. I, I finally said, Tim, you may just have to tell her. You may. Oh my God. May, it was so bad. You may not it, go. Was, it was so bad that uh, I forgot to tell you the story, Hunter. It was so bad that um, because I knew what the plan was. And so I was just all nonchalant. Here, I didn't know how girls thought. She was probably telling all her girlfriends and work friends that we were going on vacation. And I was going to ask her to marry me. And I just said, no, hell no, we're not going on vacation. And I remember where I realized I was in deep shit because I was smoking a cigar at the cigar shop down at the harbor by myself. I, I, I was a single guy. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, I got to tell Tanya now. Like, I got to put this part of the plan in place. And I'm just sitting there smoking a cigar, watching some sports game. And then I could hear tears. And I'm like, huh? This wasn't, no, no, no. This is like no big deal. We're going to, like, because in my mind, we're going to go get engaged and everything's going to be great. Well, these tears continued on for a very long time. So long that I then had to go walk across the parking lot to the Tasty Freeze and get myself some frozen yogurt. And at one point when I was. Um, yeah, she's behind you. No. Yeah, like at one point when I was getting frozen yogurt, I was like adding some kind of topping to it. She's like, are you at a store? And I'm like, no, like it was really bad. And like I, my friends were involved with it. And I'm like, she wouldn't talk to me for a few days. I'm like pumping gas at the Costco and call my friends going, I think she, I think this might be over. I think I screwed, screwed the pooch on this. And then she that. said, yeah, you yeah, had this like, whole big route. You had me yeah. in on it, Jeff in on it. It was a whole yep. big. AK, uh, AK came into the office because she had Sydney. They were going somewhere. And, and she goes, Tim, Danny told me everything. You got to tell her. And I'm like, it's that bad? 
And so Tanya said, I will come home with you. Like, I don't know why, but she reluctantly agreed to come back with me. And she goes, but we're stopping first and we're going to spend a night or two together by ourselves before we go to your parents' house. And I, I actually said, there's no way I'm sleeping alone with you. I said, you're going to kill me in my sleep. <laughs> she goes, I'm not going <laughs> to kill you. So I survived that night or two, but holy hell. Now you know it's going to work. Man, that was that was tenuous at best. I would have killed for a bad haircut and uh, and a val. I, I, forgot <laughs> I forgot all about that. Yeah, I'd forgotten all about that. So, Alex, you had something this week I found interesting. And the best part about working with other people is hopefully uh, where you work, stock nerds and market lovers, you're not in an an opinion vacuum. Like I think that uh, when everyone is thinking the same way, I mean, unless it's the big stuff, like if there's no differing opinion, oftentimes that kind of tunnel leads to a bad decision. But Alex, let me see if I can find it. Um, sent over a tweet uh, from text and, and here it is. And so um, this isn't Alex's thought. This was, Alex, who sent this uh, tweet? This isn't your work. This is intervening. Oh, one second. Is it? Yeah, I think he said. I think he said Mark, because here he goes. Mark is right. Is that who it is, Hunter? I'm pretty. Yeah, positive. it's Mark. It's Mark Minervini. Okay, and so which got me the moment Alex sent it. I'm like, this is great content for the show because uh, let me just go back to the tweet here. So uh, Mark Mir, is it Minervini or Mer Minervini? Yeah, Minervini. Uh, yeah. Some of you think I just like Kathy Wood. I'm doing this so because people don't all watch the video; they listen on the podcast. Uh, not true. I just think you don't. I just don't think you can underperform the S and P 500 by 27 percent in 11 days and be called a great money manager. You are not getting management. You are getting exposure. Big difference. That's why she is destined to blow up. And then uh, this guy has a really good take. I don't know who this guy is. Kazam. Is his real name Kazam? Because that's an awesome last name. Um, it's an 11 day performance period, relevant time period for an investor. That can be up for debate. But my first thought was she's not a money manager. She is. She has a product that people buy, and they send money into. She makes no promise of management of those funds. She puts the money to work the, the way she knows how. And then Hunter had a good point. Uh, what did What did you say, Hunter? Uh, just I said she's an asset allocator uh, in yeah. accordance with their strategy and their research and all their the stuff that goes behind Ark's decision making, um, which it is actively managed. Uh, but it's invested in accordance with the strategy and it's not going to be, you know, they're not going to go put their money in, in treasuries or in cash uh, just because ARKK is down 33% uh, in two weeks. So, I mean, that's essentially, and it, the exposure part is right. You are getting exposure to innovation because it's an innovation ETF, which inherently translates to technology. Um, but, and there's a place for that, but I do think, She's been glorified so much for her run in 2020 that there probably is a pretty decent bit of public uh, perception that's not necessarily accurate. There, there, wait, let, me, let me clean that up. A One second. I, I didn't give. And I, 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 there's a okay. time for that. So sure. her client, her client is the fund, is the ETF, not you. See, investors get confused and they say, think they're the client. She's got to invest according to the prospectus of the ETF or the mutual fund or whatever it is. It's your job to know when to buy and sell that fund. So an uptrending market, she's a rock star. In a downtrending market, it's like nuclear waste. So you got to know when to own that and not own that. Was he just creating? And I'm being, I'm not being facetious when I ask this. Was he just creating content to get people to talking? Because if if so, I, we're talking about it. Uh, I was kind of what I was going to try to lead to. Um, can you pull up XLK? Absolutely. I, I, and I apologize, Alex. I should have gone to you first since you're the one whose content created. I, I didn't. I apologize for that. Let me go to XLK. I know what XLK is, Alex. Okay, so this is the Spiders Technology ETF. Mm -hmm. um, look at the performance since November has been fairly muted, right? But on the on the crash we just had in tech, we did have a crash. It, I mean, stocks went down 30, 40%. That stock went from 139 to 125, which is off the top of my head, math wise, is about a 10% loss. Okay. So not that bad. Now, if you pull up the ARC fund, 
Let me do that. Look what happened there. So my thing, I think what Hunter was alluding to is as as a person buying one of these, you have to do a little homework. You can't just assume you're going to make money and then never lose any. You just have to measure your risk on how big could this potentially fall based on its previous performance. Yeah, that ARC fund outperformed XLK by a long shot, but look what it did when the market came down. There was a big difference in the drawdown. So you have to be willing to accept, okay, I want to get big maximum performance, but you got to time it. I mean, it's not just about picking the right stock or ETF or whatever instrument you're using. You got to get in at the right time. I, I, I think. Well, I, I was about to say, well, of course, you know, timing is is of course key. But I, I don't, I, I never thought of Kathy Wood as an as someone who's managing the funds of Arc in the most, uh, in the in the best way possible, protective in the downtrends, aggressive in the uptrends. I, I never, I never thought of her like that. Do you think Miravini actually thinks that, or Miravini? How? I, I think she does. I mean, she oh, was trimming did. Tesla at all-time highs. Was she trimming Tesla because it got too big of a position for her funds? I, I don't, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I yes. do, do know that she, her that timing's wild. kind of impeccable sometimes on the way. Like, I'll look at a stock, and I can see why she's buying. She's buying dips, so she is timing things, and everyone's looking at every little move she makes. It's almost like she's under. The, I feel almost bad for her now because she's done so well. She's a brilliant person. She, I don't know if you guys ever watch her videos. They put on YouTube every week. Here's the question. Here's the question. Can she? Can her fund move to 50, 60, 80 percent cash, or does she have to be fully invested at all times? Because it's okay to trim Tesla, but then you got to buy something else in the growth area. And if the growth area is taking a big dive, I don't want growth stocks. I don't care how good mm. they are. I want cash. You know, that's a good question. I can, I don't know the answer, but I can that's, find out. That's what I'm trying. So like, like a growth mutual fund. Okay. A lot of people go, oh, this, this tech now, like the T Rowe price uh, growth fund was a pretty good large cap growth fund during growth times, but during downturns, it's down 40, 50% because by its prospectus, it's got to be 90 or 95% fully invested at all times. They can only have enough cash to wiggle around for net redemptions if they have them and to kind of manage the fund. That's, That's why a good the, point. And they, the manager will tell you, the portfolio manager that's in there, that they manage to the fund. Their their client is the fund. It's not you. Got it. And you got to know when to buy and sell the fund. And Kathy is, is that squared because she's that much more aggressive. Her fund moves... <laughs> is magnified to XLK or other technology funds. So you better know damn well when you're buying it and you got to have an exit strategy for when to sell it. It's a great tool, but when do you own it and when do you stay away? And let me let me just say this cuz I I wonder how much I'm all um jaded not jaded, but how how much of my uh thought process here is shaded around that kind of discussion I've had with you Danny for seven seven years now where uh you know the fund is the master you know like just just all the all the things that we talk about on the podcast from from the day one about uncovering what's really happening behind the scenes that these these people aren't your friends they're they're here to they're, they're here to take in funds and and buy stocks and they're not here to protect your your wealth and i never would think of kathy would like that and i, I Surely Minervini knows that, and I don't. I'm not sure the purpose of the tweet, but unless it was just content to get people talking, which is fabulous tweet, then because he got he got me, you made me aware of it, and he stirs the, he stirs the pot. Is that okay? Is that his mo? I don't I don't follow. Well, he sells content, right? Yeah. He sells a book. He's got classes. And... Oh yeah, he's a big. Yeah. I don't want to so, say yeah. Love, so, love. But it's interesting though. How many people though do? think that their active ETF manager is there to protect them. Represent them. It's not. No, that's that's not that's not correct. Yeah. And and Kathy Wood for an ETF, I don't know if it's just because the success of the ARC funds or she went on a bunch of TV appearances talking about Tesla 4000 as her price target. And that's how I became aware. That's how I became aware of her. Yeah. Um, it's like 
I don't name another ETF fund manager. I, I yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Like I can't name one. And it's a good point. And so like, I, I don't think any of these people are yeah, like, they're just at off or you mean in her space, what, what any, any ETF fund manager. Oh, I, I sure. Say, I, I, I know mutual fund managers, but I mean, Dave Portnoy, doesn't he have an ETF now? Oh, he Buzz, manage, you know what? Yeah. 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 But the algorithm. algorithm. No, no, nothing like introducing <laughs> that at the uh, at at one of the market tops, right? That happens yeah, right? all the time. That happened, I believe, and I could be wrong. I don't want to I don't want to be uh, blasphemous here, but I believe that happened close to the introduction of FFTY as well. Oh, the IBD fifty. Yeah, the FFTY was introduced, and I remember because Danny and I did a podcast like soon after there, and I believe it was introduced uh, shortly before. Uh, a top when it when it when it came uh, came out, but I could be misremembering that as well. So let's do this, uh, Danny. You've already told people that we're here to empower individual investors, and if they have questions, they should absolutely ask us. At it. I think the easiest thing to do is to call eight five five seven two two fifty nine thirty two with no salespeople. And the reason why we don't have salespeople is because we're here to help. And so you're going to talk to one of us, and most likely you're going to talk to Danny. There's a ninety nine point nine percent Diego uh, that we're the guy with you are. You're going to talk to Danny. And so, look, if you've got a question with your client or not, you know, we don't have nothing to sell. We're not Cincinnati Life here trying to rope you into some kind of horrible, horrible garbage annuity. The Cincinnati Life commercials are the worst. First off, Skyline Chili is awful. That's, let's just get that out there. Secondly, Cincinnati Life trying to portray themselves as your friend and getting invited to your college graduations. Has, any, has anyone ever been in? I mean, do you want to really have your annuity salesperson show up to your house? I mean, unless it's a good gift giver, right? I don't think I've seen my commercials. All your friends. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Like, Any, I don't think anyone Connor... who sold you an annuity is not being invited to your your son's graduation. That's, that's like wedding. that's like that's like inviting the Amway salesman to your to your kid's graduation. <laughs> so not 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 to put down anybody uh, who works at Amway or Cincinnati Life, but. <laughs> It's just not, it's, it's just, they don't care. Like they don't care. Like they're we always, do. they just, that's the whole point. Like, like, yeah, we do. Like I get emails all the time or, or messages from people. Like you, you only, I, I only stay up hours replying to people because I care. Like at Cincinnati life, they might as well just slap Prudential on the name. Cause Prudential sure as hell doesn't give a rat's behind about you. And I know this cause I know people from Prudential. Tim, that's not all a Prudential. There's surely somebody at Prudential who cares. No, it's the whole Prudential. They're all on that rock and their logo, and they don't get a rats behind about you. So let's do this. Uh, Hunter, you got some stocks you're looking at? Yeah, I got a, I got a, a decent little bit of stuff here. Uh, just give me, some, give me, some names. Give me some. First, I'd like to say two things just to, to go back to some stuff we talked about earlier. But first on ARKK, it is – the simplest way to think about it is high beta exposure to disruptive and innovative stocks. And the reality is those high beta or names, just like growth stocks, are going to get sold off worse when the market pulls back. And ARKK was down about 50 percent in COVID uh, back in March. So it's just the reality. You just have to manage your risk appropriately. And secondly, one comment in regards to the revenue and EPS dilemma. My way of thinking is this. If the company is growing revenue at an exceptional rate and their management is executing at a high level, there's an extremely high likelihood that profits will follow. That's just pretty much how I think about it. So, Can we just pause there for one second, Hunter? And I, I apologize for interrupting your, your research. Next time when you say I'd like to go back, can you give me one serious thing and then give me one funny thing? Like if you said the serious thing about ARC funds and then go, listen, she really enjoyed the proposal and my hair's not that bad. Stop it. Like that would have been radio gold, but you went with two serious things. I just want to throw that out there for your I'll, consumption. I'll work on, on my comedic approach. Or maybe you could have said, I too sit to pee when I've had a few too many to drink. Like you could have, you could have gone a number of directions. I'm more, I'm more inclined to pee outside when I've had a few too many to drink. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I'm not going to elaborate, but peeing outside can be liberating. Oh my God. You know what? Uh, funny you say that. Remy thinks so too. Uh, uh, so when, when, see. When, yeah, Remy's great. 
<laughs> yeah, but he he I'm loved. Never, I'm, telling you, I'm telling you, he asks all the time. He goes, "Dada, I've got to pee," and I'm like, "All right, let's go." He goes, "Can we go outside?" <laughs> There's no aim required. It's yeah, it's just free. It's a sure to just wave to, to the neighbor as they go by. Well, the thing hey, is, we're hey, usually Dan. in the car when this happens. Oh. Don and I get a text the other other day, and it's for your cast name is Ravioli, right? Correct. And he's got a picture of the cat litter. He's sending it to us. He meant to send it to his future wife. Hey, can you pick this up while you're out? And we're looking at it like, what is this? It's the cat litter. It's ravioli. It was it was some stock analysis. I can't remember the name of the the litter provider, uh, but I just wanted them to get a good look at the box and the packaging. What's cat litter made of? Because I uh, I passed on the road in West Virginia on the way up. They have different uh, materials. I can't. There's a bunch of different kinds. And I, I, this is a serious question because I passed in West Virginia on the way up here. Future home of Fresh Step cat litter. That's I'm, what, like, I'm pretty nice. sure that's what I have. I think that is sure it, Fresh Step. Picture. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I've never seen a sign that said the future home of anything to do with the cat. And I'm like, wow, what's this stuff made of? Is there, are they drink, digging it out of a hole in the ground? Which maybe they are. I didn't see any holes in the ground next to the future home of Fresh Step, by the way. Anyway, go ahead, Hunter. Give me something serious now. I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Well, I mean, I just want to I want to highlight a few names that held up better than others uh, in regards to this recent sell off. But first, uh, will you pull up DBA? Doing business as? Correct. This is uh, essentially there's DBA, DBC and DBB. That's the three that I'm about to mention right here. So pretty. Um, but it's uh, an agriculture. Um, ETF essentially that yep. kind of moves in correspondence with the commodities, the reinflation play. And you've actually seen DBA and DBB uh, consolidate to the 21 uh, and bounce off of it a little bit today. So just two, I think everyone's focused on, you know, oil and gas was really hot and then banks were doing well. And, um, you know, and then now growth stocks are coming back. And so just a couple of things that are not necessarily as commonly talked about. They are a little slower. They're less volatile than a lot of stuff, uh, but the charts look great. I mean, it's DBA, DBC, DBB. They've been riding the 21 for a while now. Um, so pull up DBB too. It, it almost looks identical to DBA. Mm -hmm. Pretty much the same chart here. I mean, it's, uh, I believe, about one, one and a half or two percent off of the 21 day, a nice little consolidation. Uh, and then pull up DBC, which is kind of the leader of the three. It is the uh, the most extended and the one that has not really pulled back to the 21. So just three areas to maybe play the re the reinflation movement, which doesn't look like the inflation expectations are going to slow down in, at any time soon, based on what the Fed is doing and how everything is going. Um, and one more uh, kind of maybe off the radar a little bit. Pull up uh, XHB. The Home Builders ETF. Ah, yes. Is uh, it's actually looking like it may uh -huh. be getting ready to Keep go. Going. And now, it has. It did this before, right there in about the middle of February when it got up Sorry. to sixty-five forty-nine. Um, however, that is also when growth stocks began getting sold off really hard. And the market got really volatile really fast. So these have been moving up nicely. I mean, this is a nice continuing uptrend uh on the 21 the 50 uh and also pull up pull up dhi this yep. is just a home builder company uh that's actually in the xhb etf mm -hmm. right on the verge of breaking out to new highs right here only about 60 cents off of it they may have actually made new highs today, today they yep yeah, today. They i like i love the home builders and I mean, look at you can't see the numbers on Tim's screen, but uh, I mean, their most recent quarter, 100% EPS growth, 50% revenue growth quarter over quarter. The quarter prior to that was also really good. So uh, people are buying homes and they're building homes and, it, and it's working for them. So, uh, you know, the names Hunter in there. Um, give me one second. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go MHO, ahead. look at look at those weekly consolidations. Uh, MHO, TM. TMHC, which doesn't have a lot of high volume, uh, Taylor Morris and DHI. DOL is another one. Toll Brothers makes yeah, luxury Brothers homes. Is, look at that. Like these, these are nice weekly, weekly and then charts. And Lennar is the other one, but they have earnings in like a few days. Yeah. So just be careful with that one. All right. What else you got, brother? 
All right, just so uh, one, another kind of off the radar name, MT, pull that one up for me, is actually when we got on the call, it was uh, breaking out a little bit. I'm going to take a look and make sure it's still kind of in that range. Yeah, up about 6%, yep. push past the 2575 level from January 7th. This is a steel company, more or less. I don't necessarily know how to say the name, but it's to me, it looks like ArcelorMetal. Um, but one that uh, caught my attention because it kind of rode the 50 and the 21 upwards for the better part of January and February. And today has about 216% increase over average daily volume um, and pushing to new recent highs. I believe they've been higher in the past than they have. Uh, but in regards to 52 week high, they're making new 52 weeks high right here. And then I've, got, I've got a few more yeah. um, apps. Got really volatile, which it is just extremely volatile by nature. Um, but one of the ones that is back above the 21 and now above the 21 by a good 10% probably. But you can uh, see this on the weekly chart. That out. That's just a nice flat base develop or trying to develop right there. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's really what, so I know we've talked about this, but there are a lot of the speculative names like Space that you looked at earlier or Nano X or Unity or AI. A lot of those names got, you know, absolutely destroyed. They got cut in half or, or more. And what you want to look for in an environment where growth stocks and tech stocks and a lot of the former leaders got hit really hard is what held up the best. What didn't break the 50 day moving average or, you know, what what didn't even go down and touch the 50 day. So like pull up Twitter. Twitter never actually got down to the 50 day um, and which is especially impressive because they really had this big run leading up and somewhat during <coughs> the big growth sell off uh, and for the better part have held up really well. I mean, they ultimately had about a 20 percent pullback from that 80 level. Um, but like I said, never actually touched the 50, uh, which is impressive. And the volume pattern on this one for the last four weeks, five weeks, six weeks is actually really attractive. They've had a number, probably 10 above average volume days on up days and zero down days where volume was above average. Uh, last couple here, MU and FUTU. FUTU has earnings coming up in a couple of days, so I'd stay away from that one for the time being. But MU to me is a beautiful looking chart, kind of been fluctuating right on the 21 uh, for the last five or six trading days. Bounced off of the 50 about five or six days ago, uh, but another one that held up exceptionally well has extremely attractive numbers uh, moving forward and for the last couple of quarters. And Futu is the other one. I'm not sure if you pulled that one up yet, Tim. I did. I'm sorry. I was cycling. No, you're good. Stuff. I wasn't looking. I was looking from the left at, at MU over here. But uh, Futu, similar to Twitter, never broke the 50 day um, and actually never touched it. Uh, so anyways, just a, a handful of names that are showing strength, a couple of names that are maybe off the radar a little bit, or you, you wouldn't commonly, uh, think of, and, uh, that's it for me though, man. All right. Mr. Alex, you got anything, brother? Uh, yeah. Uh, let's look at, uh, I got two that actually look very similar. Uh, P I I Polaris. Still. There you go. Um, you know, I, I was using that 21 when I, entered and it broke out of a nice base uh never really sold off and kind of under the i like the under the radar names like hunter just mentioned something that i look for it's a little extended here um and then the other one was kmx carmax mm -hmm. kind of a very similar in their price action but uh held up well strong and they're following through so it's giving me confirmation that Price is uh, price pays. Alex, what is uh, do you know rooms ticker symbol off the top of your head? VRM. Thank you. Look at the difference between CarMax. So KMX, the one Alex is talking about, CVNA, and then VRM. Clearly, CarMax is the leader. <laughs> Clearly. All right. Um,
I've got one more, Tim, and I and I haven't looked at the chart, but I'm just basing it off of some data that I looked at. Pull up RCII Rena Center. I oh want my God! Okay. That it looks really good. I want to. I've. I'll I'll disclose that in a second. Then go ahead. What you yeah, got, brother? No, I just wanted to take a look at oh. the chart because uh, I can't remember if I saw a tweet or something the other night, and I looked at it, and I was like, wow, it's pulled back and respected the 21 a handful of times over the last few months, and this most recent time really nice bounce off of it. I've got a ton of thoughts on, on Rena Center. So Rena Center is where uh, Tanya works, my wife. And so she's in, uh, she's a director of uh, procurement there. And they, what Rena Center is really becoming is uh, a FinTech. And so uh, what's the, can someone give me the ticker symbol for a firm, please? Uh, the, the one that came IPO. AFRM. Thank you. Let me just plug this in here real quick. ARFM. So a firm, ARFM. AFRM maybe? AFR. Yeah. 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 So a firm comes public and below 100 now. Um, and what a firm does is uses AI to, uh, like when you go to make a purchase on a website, if the site has a firm's software in it, a firm uses uh, artificial intelligence to determine your credit worthiness, credit risk, and then offers you the ability to pay in installments uh, for major purchases. That's been the trend for a while now in e-commerce and direct to consumer companies. A firm's biggest customer is Peloton. So Peloton sells mo most bikes. <clears throat> so how people pay for Pelotons is using the firm software, which is really interesting into itself. And so now all these private companies are being snapped up. And so Rena Center, I, I have no insight knowledge. Like I, matter of fact, I, I know so little about the inner workings of Rena Center, other than what I'm sh sharing with you right now. It's not because Tiny and I talk, it's because I read. And I'm like, you guys just acquired Asima, and it sounds like you're becoming a fintech. And she, and Asima uses AI to make credit decisions. And my thought is that I don't know if I don't know if Rena Center continues to have storefronts in the future. I have no uh, thoughts on that whatsoever. But the the concept of acquiring your goods uh, over four payments or five payments or 10 payments uh, and, and being judged on the credit worthiness uh, by uh, companies like Asima, companies like Affirm is where that whole space is headed. And so uh, they, they're, they're not just, if, you, if anyone's familiar with uh, uh, Renaissance Center or there's one that starts with the A that I can't think of off the top of my head right now, uh, nice. where you rent to own. Hey, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's Aaron's. It's, it's, it's a public company too, isn't it? Yeah, AAN is the, t is the ticker. Looks like they thank you. just came back public again. Maybe they were taken private and then came back. Something like that. Um, and so uh, when you're looking at Rena Center, I, I had this talk with Danny a while ago. I, I, they're, they're a fintech. They're, they're, they're not in the business of... Uh, selling goods per se they're using financial technology to make uh, to get access to give access to people that may not traditionally have access using a different model and uh, and that's where the whole space that's where all direct consumers if you look at paypal paypal gets a lot of press for uh crypto but uh one of paypal's biggest uh selling features right now is competing with a firm so paypal now offers four equal installments if you if you apply just like a credit card They'll give you the ability with no interest, with zero interest, to split up your major payments uh, over four over four periods. It's it's absolutely where the whole world's heading. And funny you mentioned what brought your attention to RCII, Hunter. I I can't remember where I read about it. Um, it was either last night or the night before. I just I read something and I was like, oh, let me go look at RII or is it RCII? I think it is. But yeah. anyways, and I was like, wow, this looks great. It, I think uh, I should know this. I, I'm I'm fairly certain Tanya has stock in uh, her retirement plan. But the for me the biggest miss was this because I mean I I I, I talked to Tanya. So let's look at last year. <laughs> like it, complete completely. Where's March at? I'm sorry. I'm trying to find where this stock here bottomed here. out at. Here yeah, look look at down here. This is 20. That's 2016. I apologize. Let me get to March. I'm way off on my time frames. October, September, July. Here it is. There's May, April. This thing was was just around ten dollars. Yeah. yeah, I mean complete, 
complete miss, uh, one of the bigger misses, and I just keep watching it, and I'm like, I, why, why am I not doing anything with this? Funny that you mentioned I, RCII, but that whole, everything gets bought that transforms itself into a fintech, just like, uh, what's that company, Don? It was like a lemonade company, and then it became a blockchain company, and then I had riot. Riot. it was riot. Riot. <laughs> riot. Yeah, Quiet Riot uh r-i-o-t like this this was a lemonade company or a drink company and they they called themselves riot blockchain and all of a sudden just whoop, takes off and so nuts what's going on don you want to do a preview of uh what's coming up on you got a, you got the thursday night video hunter for encore on friday night you got you're going to do a little 21 over 21 uh tonight yeah the 21 21 has held up uh, very well this week. In fact, there's not a single stock that's going to drop off of it. We had uh, one pierce the 21 and come right back up through it. So uh, it's probably the most diverse 21 over 21 that has been put together uh, because of the emergence of non-tech companies and the sell-off in a bunch of the software and uh, Kathy Wood type stocks. But what we've seen today is yesterday, let's go back to yesterday. We, we had a, an inflation number. We had the CPI came out and it was non-inflationary. And the, the, the futures went from uh, negative to gapping up at the open a little less than a percent. But as soon as the NASDAQ 100, the QQQ came into the 21 day, which is now declining, it reversed. And a bunch of these leaders that were beaten down, that were trying to come back, reversed hard. Uh, it had the same thing this morning, another gap up, and uh, people were going to say, well, you're not going to fool me again, but the exact opposite happened. We followed through, busted through the 21, and now we're coming into the 50-day moving average on the NASDAQ 100, and that's going to be a big level. That's about the 320, between 320 and 321 on the NASDAQ 100. Uh, still a lot of broken charts out there, but there have been enough emerging leaders, not only in the new the new type sectors, but uh, the survivors, Hunter talked about a few of them. I mentioned 10 of them in Tuesday night's videos. We have uh, positions in five or six of them, uh, but it's enough uh, surviving leadership and a few of the damaged ones that found support at their 100-day moving average are coming back up through the 50 today. Sure. So uh, plenty of stocks to pick from. Uh, with good entry points and low, good risk reward points, because if you get through the 50 by a percent or two and turn around and fail back at the 50 uh, either tomorrow, meaning Friday or next week, you've got a very easy stop out because leaders should be trending above their 50 day moving average. Don, I have a question. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, and I'm sure our, the viewers will be confused too. Can you go over how IBD went to resumed uptrend? and how today might be a follow through day for people yeah, that follow I, us, they probably follow them. Yeah, IBD typically has uh, some strict rules that they need to see a certain percentage on an index on a fourth to seventh day off of the bottom in order to call a follow through day. And normally that index is the NASDAQ, but it can be one of the other ones. But they've also got a caveat to the rule that if one of the major indexes makes a new high that they're going to reverse their correction call and go back into uptrend resumed. And that's what happened with the Dow yesterday. Uh, so they took, uh, they went out of market and correction to back into uptrend resumes. And we could be seeing a follow through day on the NASDAQ today. The NASDAQ very strong, currently up 2.6%. And that, that follow through day would just uh, confirm their call to go back into uh, market in an uptrend. So um, are the NASDAQ, those six distribution days that we've had, is that wipe slate clean? In this case, through? in this case, they didn't wipe them clean because they didn't have a follow through day. But I believe if they have the, a formal follow through day that they will wipe them clean. Okay. But no, there I are, think, if you're sorry. making all in or all out decisions based on that, I don't, I don't think you're doing things correctly. Um, but that's just my opinion, and it's from a lot of years of uh, of uh, watching it. I, I don't wait for that all clear signal. I look for the at the action of individual stocks. Some held up, some stops got hit. There's no reason to sell a good acting stock if market if the market goes into correction, or to not buy something because it's very obvious that money is rotating into it. Uh, 
to, to just flat out avoid it. There's, there's times to buy certain things, there's times to avoid them. And that's, uh, that's what we do here at Revere. All yeah, right, Danny, let's do the uh, standard close. And then I got one last thing. I have one last thing as well. Oh, whoa, 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 Hunter. Let's get your one last oh, thing in Hunter. here. What Go is ahead, Danny. This, this will be shocking. So I just want everyone to get ready. Tim, will you pull up DKNG for me? <laughs> wow, I, did, I did not see that coming. He is starting to get like all-star wrestling with Tim and Don. Look, all, all I want to say is that this one held up better than a lot of other gross stocks. Um, it's actually came within 15 cents of making new all-time highs this morning. Uh, but the reason I wanted to talk about DraftKings is three things. They just partnered with Dish to essentially take what Fubu was or Fubo was supposed to be uh, kind of revolutionizing in, in regards to combining streaming with uh, sports betting. And they also partnered with the UFC as their primary partner for online betting uh, or betting in general. And I believe Connecticut just passed online sports betting. So just something to uh, some information on DraftKings, which is acting like one of the leaders in the market. I think we I might think, have lost uh, Tim. Yeah, we lost Tim. Which means I don't I don't know if we can uh, end the video without Mr. Tim there. Well, he can always clip it out. Yeah, I just Listen. got a little alert that said it'll end automatically in 60 minutes if he can't come back. So I guess we'll just clip the remaining 60 minutes. <laughs> All right, folks. Listen, if you like what you heard, please tell a friend, tell a neighbor. Uh, you can just go to revereasset.com and they and they can sign up for our daily uh, our daily market insight. There's a subscribe button. We won't email them or pester them at all. It's up to them to come out and reach out to us and ask for help. There's also a webinars button uh, that signs up for Don's about quarterly lunch and learn when he has time on Wednesday at noon Eastern. That's an hour long. And if you if you sign up for that, he'll say, even if you got to work, he'll send you the recorded uh, uh, copy. There's a Q&A at the end. You can also ca uh, call us old school at 855-REAL-WEALTH. Again, we'll talk to you next week on your money. Are you fellas still there? Yeah, we, just, we just logged out. We just said, uh, we just closed it up, Tim. <laughs> You know what? Um, I'm going to leave all that in because I saved it. I saved the show. So, Hunter, yeah. you killed the show with DKNG, so we're going to move on. Danny, take us. I just did. I just took us out. No, nobody heard it. I swear to God, nobody heard it. Okay. All right, folks. Do it, do it again. And if it's, if it's done twice, uh, yeah. we'll come back to one last thing. All right, folks. If you like what you heard, tell a friend, tell a neighbor. Just send them to revereasset.com. They can sign up for our daily market newsletter. Um, it's a subscribe button. We won't eat. We won't uh, pester them in any way. They'll just it'll just go right to their inbox. It's up to them to reach out to us. You can sign up at the webinars button. There's two signups. Don's webinars. He he does a lunch learn about once a quarter, and it's an hour long at noon Eastern on Wednesdays. Um, and you can do a Q and A at the end. But even if you work and you can't join it, then just uh, uh, he'll send you the recorded copy. You can always call us old school at 855 Real Wealth, and you can email us with any questions at dan at revereasset.com, don at revereasset.com, tim at revereasset, alex at revereasset, or hunter at revereasset. We made it real easy for you. And I've got, uh, I don't know if my charts will reconnect. It says connecting here, but uh, the internet kind of got screwed up there for a second. So I'll, I'll, my one last thing, uh, so, Europe did something really interesting, uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, with um, the uh, Danny. What's Christine Lagarde? Uh, uh, lead? The IMF. The, yeah, the IMF. And so, uh, working, working in. No, no, she's not the IMF. She's now the European um, ECB. ECB. She's the ECB, European Central Bank. She's the and new Draghi. Yeah, she's the new Draghi. And so. They came in today, uh, this morning, and said they're going to buy bonds, and that's a really big deal. So, as you know, and I would pull up my charts, but my charts just went offline. Bond prices have been falling, okay, which means yields have been going higher, which also means the ten-year Treasury has been going higher, which has been really not good for stocks, especially tech stocks or uh, the anti. Um, 
the stocks that get hurt when there's inflation. And so rates go up typically when there's perceived to be inflation. Even though uh, uh, J-Pal, who uh, kapowed the markets last week, um, says there's not gonna, they're not going to raise rates and, and inflation is in check, the markets still are pulling back when rates are going higher and bond prices are falling. And so what's really interesting here with what Lagarde says is that she's going to step in and be the backstop. This is no different than when Warren Buffett comes out and says, I'm going to buy XYZ stock. Or uh, when, when Danny, remember in 2015, uh, Kramer got on the phone with Tim, Tim I, I almost called him Tim Apple, <laughs> but Tim Cook from Apple. And he's like, I've got it on good authority that Apple's going to start buying back more stock. And, and it, it's no different. It's a backstop. And it, it doesn't matter why something's happening, what you think it says about the state of the economy. If the, enough bonds are bought and the European Central Bank is the one that steps in front of this uh, train and then maybe Japan follows and then maybe U.S. follows with a wink and a nod like, well, they're doing it. We should be doing it, too. That's going to be good for stocks because it's going to stop. Rates I, think, from, I think that's already happening. I think the yeah. Fed is already buying, and they're just not articulating it as well as Christine Lagarde. She just came out and said, we're doing it. The yeah. Fed is behind the scenes doing it. Rates have dropped, and now the market's rallied. Yeah, and so it looks like my charts are back online. And so it's really important that uh, – no, they're not back online. And so understanding what's happening because, uh, again, if you're married to a direction in the market, it gets really tough when out of, out of the blue – uh, the ECB says, no, 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 we're going to stop what's happening. And some might equate it to uh, they're changing the rules where you couldn't buy or sell GME or enough shares of GameStop or, or whatever. Yeah, like whatever it is. Look, they're going. the banks right now are going to do – Daniel will just come out and tell you the banks are going to do whatever they can do to stop, this mar to stop a market from imploding. And I'm going to come out a little more nuanced and say – that they can't let this thing fall apart here in the States because it's it's the way the, the retirement system is set up. But the bottom line is, is under, being able to understand what's happening in real time. And that announcement this morning, and Don talked about some other things that took place yesterday in the markets with the CPI number, understanding that if they stop bond prices from falling, that means bond prices either trade sideways or go up. That means rates trade, trade sideways or go down, and that is bullish for equities. And so I think it's, it doesn't mean it has to happen. As I always say, and Mark from Buffalo lets me know that I typically say it once a video, it's a market and anything can happen. But right now, that announcement from Lagarde, I think is uh, a pretty big deal. And I would look for other central banks to follow in lockstep. Take us home, Daniel. Folks, have a safe weekend and peace standing up like we do in Texas. We'll talk to you next week on your money. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> See you guys.